Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming to the Data Quality Seminar Series. I'm Leif Nelson, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Sydney Scott. In addition to Sydney, we have a number of great panelists who will be here today. Jeff Goodwin, Clayton Critcher, Kate Baraz, Nora Williams, and Jane Risen. In addition to all of them, we also have Joe Simmons and Yuri Simonson who will be joining us for the duration today. If you haven't done this before, the best way to interact with us during the session is to submit questions to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Those will be read by all of us and potentially it means that we can voice them during the session. But even if we don't, they all get recorded and I can share those with Sydney after the talk. In addition, because Nora is a co-author on today's presentation, she might be able to type in some answers or at least uh, give a more sternly uh, stop to Sydney if she really thinks a question needs to be our to vo voiced and answered at that moment. So with all of that in mind, uh, I'm, uh, the floor is yours, Sydney. Great, thank you. I am going to share my slide deck. Can I get a thumbs up if you can see it? Great, awesome, okay. Uh, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be joined by this wonderful group of panelists and present my work on uh, how people pursue their self-improvement goals. So this is some work I've been doing with Nora, and this paper is titled, In Goal Pursuit, Flexibility is the Best Choice for Me, but Not for You. Uh, it turns out people regularly pursue health and self-improvement goals. So. For example, in the United States, at least 35% uh, of people set a New Year's resolution at the beginning of the year. Some common resolutions include saving more money, uh, learning a new skill or hobby, or um, improving your health and fitness, perhaps by eating healthier or maybe exercising more. So this is a common thing that people do. And what we were interested in is how do people set themselves up for success? So in particular, when they've set a goal and they're just making a plan to achieve that goal, um, what do people think is the best way to set themselves up to stay on track? And one useful distinction that's been identified in prior work is the distinction between more rigid plans and more flexible plans. Uh, so for example, in a rigid plan, you might have a goal and decide on a lot of the details ahead of time. Uh, whereas in a flexible plan, you might decide on those details as you go. Let's be more concrete uh, and think about a specific goal. Perhaps you want to exercise more. In a more rigid plan, you might say, I want to exercise two times a week, and I am going to exercise at these specific times on these specific days, and this is what I'm going to do. Uh, in a more flexible plan, you might also have that goal to exercise twice a week, but sort of decide exactly when you're going to exercise or what you're going to do as you go. Uh, so this is a distinction that's been talked about. Largely, people have looked at what happens when we randomly assign people to have more rigid versus more flexible plans. Um, so for example, work on implementation intentions has uh, suggested that in general, when we increase the detail and rigidity in a plan, um, people are more successful at getting to their goal. Uh, but what we're interested in, in is a slightly different question, which is when do people choose rigid versus flexible plans in the first place? Uh, so we're interested in how people think about these plans and uh, we also wanted to understand whether their thinking depends on whether they focus on their own situation or someone else's situation. So we were interested in this aspect for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, these goals are just generally not done in a vacuum. Um, people regularly sort of seek advice or exchange advice on how to improve your fitness or save money. Um, in fact, a lot of the apps that are offered to help people uh, on these self-improvement journeys um, include things like forums to ask questions or even maybe um, options to get an advisor or a trainer. Um, not only do people exchange advice, but sometimes actually they have somebody make the decisions for them. So you could hire a nutritionist or a personal trainer. Um, even beyond just hiring somebody to do it, 
sometimes we make decisions on behalf of others um, that are relevant to their goal pursuit. So for example, in couples, some recent research has shown that um, one person tends to be sort of the CFO of the couple and do more of the financial decision making. And so that person is going to be making choices and decisions that are relevant to their partner's goal to save money. So for pragmatic reasons, we thought it was important to understand how this might depend on whether you're thinking about your own situation or someone else's. Um, we also thought that thinking about somebody else's uh, situation is a useful sort of foil. Um, it might help us understand how people are thinking about this in themselves by uh, comparing it to how people are thinking about somebody else. So it's helpful from that theoretical perspective as well. Um, okay, so I'll dive into how we started to test this question. Uh, we tested this across a number of studies. Um, I'll start with uh, two studies. So study 1A is with students and looking at how they plan for their final exams. So we recruited students from our behavioral lab during the last week of classes, which is right before they're studying an exam period. And we randomly assigned them to either think about their own study plans or to think about another student's study plans. So I'll call that the self condition and the other condition. Um, and if you were in the self condition, this is what the stimuli would look like. So just to give you some understanding of exactly how we describe this to participants, uh, we would say if you were in the self condition, we are interested in how you make study plans for the final exam period. Here are two broad ways you can plan your studying. Um, a, you could commit to studying for a certain length of time or number of chapters, topics lectures and decide ahead of time exactly when you will study. For example, commit to study 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. Tuesday, 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Wednesday, etc. So this is the more rigid option, but we don't, we'd use uh, not the word rigid itself, but talk about, you know, deciding things ahead of time. Uh, option B, you could commit to studying for a certain length of time or number of chapters, lectures, topics, and decide as you go exactly when you will study. For example, decide on a day-by-day -day basis, whether you study in the morning, afternoon, evening, or some combination. So importantly, um, while both study plans involve committing to studying for a certain length of time or a number of chapters, uh, option B is more flexible because the details of when to study can be decided on a day-by-day -day basis. And then we asked people, if you sat down right now to plan out your studying for finals, which option would you choose? Okay, so that's the self-condition they chose A or B. In the other condition, things were very similar, but we asked them to make a recommendation for another student. Uh, so we said, we're interested in how you would recommend another student who was also taking the survey, make study plans for their final exam period. The descriptions were very similar here, but the pronouns were they instead of I. And then at the end, it asked if another student were about to sit down right now to plan out their studying for finals, which option would you recommend to them? So that's the design. Uh, and the key comparison was choice of plan type, depending on whether you're choosing it for yourself or for somebody else. Uh, in the self condition, um, it was about 50-50. 57% uh, of people are choosing that flexible option for themselves. But when they make a recommendation to somebody else, uh, only 32% are recommending the flexible plan to another person. Uh, so in other words, people are more likely to choose flexibility for somebody else than for themselves. Um, we also had a number of exploratory measures. Um, so for example, one thing you might wonder is, do people just think it's more important? It's a more important goal to somebody else as compared to yourself. Um, so we asked people to rate how important studying for their, for their exams was, and everybody actually rated it for themselves and also rated how important studying was to another person. So we're better powered here because it's within subjects. Um, but we didn't find any significant differences. So on a one to five scale, they're both about a four. So it's very important and similarly important to me and to somebody else. 
So it doesn't appear to be about differences in the importance of the goal. Um, we also asked if they do this, and it turns out they do this regularly. So 90% of students said they do this, like sometimes often or always. So this is a pretty familiar task, um, an important task and one that's upcoming, and we still see this soft other difference. Uh, so that's study one. Um, Cindy, can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah, there? Of course. I, I'm just thinking about the difference between making a choice for the self and making a recommendation for someone else. So I might think for myself, oh, that that uh, rigid plan sounds great, but I just don't know my schedule in that much detail right now to answer all those questions. Whereas for someone else, that might be true for them, but I don't know. But I'm, I'm just making a recommendation that you, you should, I think this would be a good idea to do. So maybe for the self, I would also make that recommendation. It's just, I know it's not practical right now to, to implement. Yeah, I think that's a really great point. So uh, we started out with recommendation language because we thought it was very externally valid. Um, like often we're making recommendations and giving advice, um, but because of concerns like this of, you know, is it about recommendation versus choice or is it about self versus other? We ended up moving to different language in the next study where people are just actually making a choice for themselves or actually making a choice for someone else. So maybe that'll help get at this question. Um, <clears throat> so in study Can one- Can I follow on question? Yeah, that? sure. Um, so another thought I had was what's ideal? And I'm, you will probably touch on this later, but like probably we choose flexible, but we should be choosing rigid. So I'm also wondering if it's like other, if you're recommending something to another person or choosing for them, because that's the ideal and optimal way that you should do it, but normatively, like we, we don't actually do it like that. That's the norm, but we do it a different way for ourselves. Yeah. Um, so I think, well, there's almost, there's two separate questions of um, <clears throat> what is actually ideal and, or what is actually effectively going to get you to your goal. And then also, what do people think is effectively going to get them to their goal? So um, one question is, do people think this is effectively going to get them to their goal? Um, and that is actually um, something we're going to look at and related to really the mechanism we look at when we are figuring out why this self-other difference occurs. Um, so I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'll, I'll get to that right after study 1B. And then if I haven't answered that, you can jump right back in and tell me that um, that wasn't quite your question, maybe. Um, okay, great. So study 1B is about New Year's resolutions. Uh, we wanted to have actually people make, people actually make plans and we wanted it to be a goal that they had and were about to start. Um, so we ended up conducting the study at the beginning of 2021. We basically got a thousand people on prolific um, we asked them if they had a New Year's resolution and if yes, what their most important resolution was. And then we narrowed it down to 565 people who had one of these four common resolutions as their most important resolution. Um, so these resolutions were saving money, exercising more, losing weight, and learning a new skill or hobby. Um, <clears throat> so for these participants, we then randomly assign them to either choose a plan for themselves and make that plan or choose a plan for another participant with that goal um, and then that participant would make that plan. So let me walk you through kind of what it looked like. Um, in terms of the structure, you were randomly assigned to the self condition or the other condition. Um, in both cases, we described broadly that there are two types of plans you can make, flexible and rigid, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, then in the self condition, we said, please choose a plan, a uh, type of plan to make for yourself. And then they made the plan. In the other condition, we said, please choose a type of plan that another participant with this goal is going to make. Uh, and then in order to make it all sort of true and incentive compatible, we actually recruited a separate sample and then yoked them so that somebody was actually making that plan. So that's the idea. Uh, and in terms of how this was described to participants, here's an example. So this varied a little depending on which goal you had, which resolution, but this is the fitness resolution. Uh, method A, this method is useful if you are going to decide on details ahead of time. 
For example, your plan might be, I commit to exercising Monday at 7 a.m. by going on a two mile run, and on Thursday at 6 p.m. by going on a two mile run. Method B, this method is useful if you're going to decide on the details as you go. For example, your plan might be, I commit to exercising two times a week. I will decide when I exercise and what exercises I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so this is about when you exercise and determining when you exercise ahead of time or not. Um, for the uh, saving money version, we talked about deciding ahead of time or not what you are going to save money on. Um, for the learning a hobby, it was deciding ahead of time when you're going to sit down and learn the hobby. And then for the lose weight uh, resolution, it was deciding what you're going to eat ahead of time or not. So um, some uh, we did that in order to like test robustness across operationalizations of flexibility and rigidity. All right. Uh, and so here are the results. So this is broken down by resolution. Uh, the flexible option was more popular for some resolutions than others, as you can see. So it was more popular for exercise, for example, than for like saving money. But importantly, there's a consistent gap between the green and the blue bars um, across each of the resolutions. And so in other words, people were more likely to choose a flexible plan for themselves um, than to choose a flexible plan for somebody else. And again, this is for actual New Year's resolutions they had and actual plans they were going to make. So that's uh, the effect, um, uh, the self-other difference. Um, but importantly, we also, of course, wanted to understand why. And I think that Kate's question um, sort of got a little bit to what we ended up thinking about. So we were interested in why does this self-other difference exist? Uh, and we narrowed in on one reason, which has to do with how people perceive flexibility and rigidity. So uh, we thought that it might be that people think that they're facing a trade-off or a conflict. Um, a rigid plan is a plan that's likely to get them to the outcome they want, to their goal, um, but it also might be a little bit unpleasant. Um, it's not as pleasant an experience to use a, <clears throat> excuse me, use a rigid plan. And let me give you an example of like why you might have this intuition. Uh, let's say your plan is to exercise twice a week and you specifically have a rigid detailed plan where you plan to exercise at 7 a.m. on Monday morning. But then maybe you have trouble sleeping the night before, you're kind of tired when you wake up and to do your morning run, you'd really like to sleep in and not exercise at 7 a.m. Uh, under a more flexible plan, you can sleep in and <clears throat> run at a different time, but in a rigid plan, you sort of have to do the thing you don't want to do of getting up and exercising. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm going to have some water. Um, okay, so that's one reason uh, why people might think of rigidity as a bit less pleasant. Um, we decided to just ask people if they think this. So we did a pilot study on prolific and we asked people to think about making plans and which type of plan would be more effective and which type of plan would be more unpleasant. <clears throat> so here, um, it turns out then when you ask people which type of plan will be more effective, 81% um, say the rigid plan, which is to say the plan where I have decided all of the details ahead of time. Uh, but when you ask them about what's pleasant, they don't necessarily think that plan is going to be more pleasant. Um, so here, 56% of people actually also think that the rigid plan is going to be more unpleasant. Uh, which is to say, many people think that they're facing a conflict between rigid effective plans and flexible appealing plans. Sydney, can I ask a small question? Yeah, of course. Um, so I mean, I, I get for New Year's resolutions that it, it is, most of these things are intrinsically. I, I wanna exercise more because exercising is good for me, but it's not that fun to do. 
what what happens if someone instead of it being a new year's resolution someone said i really like eating cheesecake and either i'm going to eat cheesecake whenever i want or i'm going to eat cheesecake tuesday mornings and thursday evenings or whatever would we prescribe for other people that they should have a rigid plan so that they eat more cheesecake or but for ourselves we want to be flexible like how far does it extend does it have to be this mixture of unpleasantness and self-regulation that people are sensitive to yeah i think that's a great question um and uh we haven't tested sort of these leisure goals specifically but there's some other work on scheduling mindsets um showing that people also think that um doing a detailed schedule for a plan like to go and eat ice cream um is going to make it less pleasant um where i'm not sure how far it'll map is the efficacy component um it, it's just not as natural to think about an effective plan to eat cheesecake um and i'm not sure if that's how participants think about it in that context um but i haven't tested it empirically it's possible um so i'd be interested in in knowing whether people also think of how effective their cheesecake plan is. Uh, but, but there is some evidence from other literature that the unpleasantness generalizes. Um, yeah, hopefully that, that helps. So an empirical question. Um, other questions before I dive into the mechanism a little more? Okay, cool. So people might perceive <clears throat> this trade-off between what's rigid and effective and what's flexible and appealing. Um, this is sort of like people thinking about um, an option they should do and an option they want to do, a want option and a should option. And people also say that, you know, the rigid plan uh, is more like what they should do, but it's not necessarily what they want to do in this pilot study. Um, and it turns out these decisions between something I want to do and something I should do are so common that we actually you know, talk about how we think about these decisions in everyday language with particular phrases. Um, and in particular, one thing we talk about is whether we are going to follow our heads or follow our hearts. Uh, so we think this um, is a distinction that's relevant to what people are ultimately going to choose. Uh, and it's been talked about in prior work um, by some people on this panel, in fact. Uh, and uh, we ended up talking about this as following your head being relying on dispassionate reason and following your heart being relying on feelings and desires. Um, what we expected is basically that uh, if you follow your heart, you're more likely to rely on you know, how you feel or what you think will feel good, which would lead you to choose a flexible plan more often. Um, moreover, we expected that you're more likely to process things by following your head when you're choosing for others as opposed to yourself. So when we're choosing for others, um, the things that loom large are likely these, these questions about like, what's effective? What's the logical choice that gets me to my goal? And even if I understand that people might have, might see the flexible plan as feeling good, I'm, I'm eas more easily able to like ignore those considerations when I'm choosing for someone else. And so if we choose for others, uh, our prediction is that we'll follow our heads more uh, and choose these rigid plans. But when we're choosing for ourselves, uh, the emotional considerations loom a bit larger. Um, it's more salient to us how something is going to make us feel, and we might weigh that more in our decision making, which means that we're going to be sort of following our heads and our hearts. Um, and this should lead us to choose flexible, appealing plans more often for ourselves as compared to for somebody else. So this was our hypothesis in terms of the psychology and the lay theories underpinning this effect. And we tested um, this part directly uh, through mediation and moderation. Um, so I'll show you the mediation study first. Uh, we- Can I ask a quick question? Yeah before you jump back in. So I've been, I, I have in my mind some sort of combo plan and I'm curious how it would be, how, which category or 
it could fit into or whether it just kind of ruins things. But if you take a rigid plan, like I'm gonna exercise twice a week, Monday morning, Thursday evening, and then add in something like, and if I can't do one of those, I will instead go on Saturday morning. Or some, you could, you could think about in actually putting some flexibility into your rigid plan. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether, does that change the pleasantness? Does that change the effectiveness? Like, I'm just trying to think about how to think of, about a plan of that sort and where you think it would be changing uh, people's experience. Yeah, so uh, one thing that this is getting at is flexibility and rigidity is more, it's a continuum. Even though we've operationalized it often as like a choice between these two, um, you can have different degrees of rigidity and flexibility. Um, I would think of that as a way to um, move a rigid plan on the continuum of most rigid to most flexible as like a bit more flexible. Um, so that's how I suspect it would be interpreted. Um, and in fact, in study three, we'll sort of look at it on a continuum and, and test whether these results generalize to thinking about not just rigid versus flexible, but like how much flexibility. Um, does that help answer that question? Yeah, I was just trying to think about what would make me choose a rigid plan and does that, would that help? And is it because it's changing the pleasantness or because it's changing something else about the plan? Like Clayton was saying, because now it just allows, I, I'm less likely to fail, right? Failing is much more likely under a rigid plan. And so as soon as I bake in some flexibility, then I don't have to fear failing quite as much. Yeah. And that feels potentially different from just a pleasant, or maybe it is tied into the way you're thinking about pleasantness. So, I, I would push back a little on the failing because I, that actually seemed like completely plausible to us a priori, but it turns out that when we ask people like which of these is most likely to get you to your goal, um, people do seem to understand and say that the rigid plan is the one that's most likely to keep me on track. It's most likely to effectively get me to achieving my goal. Um, and it's the one that I should do. So I, I don't think, I think that our evidence suggests that people um, actually think that the rigid plan is not the one where you're most likely to fail. It's the flexible plan. Um, that said, um, I think that uh, you could probably make a rigid plan sound more appealing by adding a little bit of flexibility to it. Um, I, I suspect that would work. We're gonna, in the later studies, look at ways to nudge people into rigidity. And so, so that is where we're going. That wasn't the direction we ended up going, but, um, uh, but I'll, show you, I'll show you the way we did end up going in, in a couple of studies. Does that make sense? Just okay. on the, that back and forth there on failure, it seems like there's an important distinction between, I think what Jane's saying is maybe right, that people will fail to live up to that rigid goal, even if people think in the end, they're more likely to say, lose more weight or exercise more. So there may be the aversiveness of like, oh yeah, I failed to follow my rigid plan, even if they think, but in the end, I'll still come out better. Yeah. So I think... That's true, like you shoot for the moon, land among the stars or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I think they do think that all sequel, they're more likely to, like they're not like, they're more likely to stay on track if they, if they do this rigid plan. Um, maybe they think that, you know, it's unlikely that it'll achieve everything they want um, in both conditions, but they at least seem to think their best shot is with these detailed rigid plans. Uh, okay, so in our mediation study, we just looked at how people chose flexible versus rigid plans for themselves and for others, um, and whether this effect was predicted by the way they were making their choice. So, we asked people to imagine they were reading more and then we asked them to think about choosing between two plans and this should look familiar at this point. One plan you sort of decide ahead of time when you're going to read and then the other plan you decide as you go. Uh, so the ahead of time is more rigid and the as you go is more flexible. People were asked what is the best choice for you or in the other condition, 
they were asked, what is the best choice for another person? So it's a two cell design, self versus other. And then after people made a choice, they were also asked how they made that choice. And so we said, you could make a choice by following your head or following your heart. Um, and then we gave a little bit more information about what that means based on some definitions from prior literature. And then we asked them how they made the decision about which reading plan was best for them or for the other person if they were in the other condition. Uh, and they could indicate I was completely following my head, I was completely following my heart or somewhere in between. So um, as uh, shown in previous studies and replicating those effects, uh, people do choose the flexible plan more often for themselves than for somebody else. Uh, additionally, um, people were following their heart more when choosing for themselves as compared to when choosing for someone else. Uh, so four would be the midpoint. Um, interestingly, people are actually like both following their heads uh, a bit. You know, they're, they're on the following their head side of the midpoint, which I think makes sense. You know, planning some type of self-improvement goals seems like a, a logical task where you would want to follow your head and think about rational considerations. Um, but they're doing that, especially when they're choosing for others. Whereas when they're choosing for themselves, they're doing more of a mix of following their heads and following their hearts. And so finally, uh, we also looked at whether this follow your heart measure mediated the effect. Um, and indeed, when you're choosing for yourself versus somebody else, our model uh, suggests that you follow your heart more than your head, um, which increases your choice of a flexible method. Um, so this is some evidence for the mechanism, uh, but you know, mediation at its core is, is correlational and we wanted to get at this a different way. Um, so we ended up also looking at whether um, we could get at the process through moderation. Denise, could uh, I just ask you a question here? Yeah. I, ju I just wanted to float an alternative explanation. I don't think this explains the mediation evidence, but it's Clayton's question kind of was, got me thinking about this. When I'm thinking about the self, I have a much more vivid representation of the various obstacles that could get in the way. You know, I have a much richer conception of my own life than I do of somebody else's life. And so I'm just wondering about an alternative story where it's reasoning essentially in both cases, but it's just reasoning with different information. I'm reasoning based on all of the information I have about my own obstacles, but reasoning with a sort of relative paucity of information about the obstacles that could confront you. And so yeah. that would be not so much head versus heart, but just different information. Yeah. So, um, the, the, the sausage making behind this, uh, this paper is that we, for six months, uh, like could not figure out what was going on. And that was like the first series of mechanisms we tried to look at was trying to understand, we thought it might be something more cognitive where it's about the availability of um, obstacles where I need or, or other commitments where I need flexibility for myself, but that's not available to other people. Um, and I still think that might be part of what's at play, um, but we didn't end up finding strong evidence for that. It was like at best mix, sometimes we got the mediation, but then we tried to directly replicate it and didn't quite get it. Um, and then, so then we ended up sort of going back to the drawing board and saying, okay, what are some other reasons why this might occur? Um, and this ended up being a, a path where we got much more um, strong, consistent evidence for it. Um, but I think that there's probably multiple mechanisms at work here, especially with, it's, it's a rather, in my experience, like it's a bigger effect, self other difference. So I expect there are multiple things at play here. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, okay. so. Uh, in our next study, we looked at testing this through moderation. Um, we uh, manipulated whether you were choosing for yourself or someone else. And also, uh, in some cases, we asked people to follow their heads. So here, um, people are going to choose for themselves or choose for someone else. In the control condition, we don't tell them how to do that. 
Um, and we expect in that condition, they're gonna follow their heads more when choosing for others as opposed to themselves. Um, we then in this instructed to follow your head condition, try to get people all to follow their heads when they're choosing for themselves and others. Um, we expected that this would attenuate the effect and lead people to choose more rigid plans, both for themselves and for others. So that's the idea here. Uh, we ended up going into the domain of eating healthy. And I'm gonna show you the stimuli just for the self follow your head condition. So there are four cells here. Um, in the self condition, you were asked, people were asked to imagine that they were eating healthy. Um, we now look at a continuum of flexibility to rigidity in the plan, um, in part because uh, we're expecting an attenuated interaction, and so we wanted to try and up our power. Um, and so we ended up asking people to think about a continuum of plans on one end or one extreme. You might decide every single thing as you go, including what you eat, when you eat, how much you will eat what to do if you have cravings. So this is like the most flexible plan. You might decide to eat healthy and choose meals as you go here. At the other extreme, you might decide every single thing ahead of time, including what you eat, when you eat, how much you will eat, and what you will do if you have cravings. For example, you might decide to eat healthy and plan each meal down to the gram ahead of time in a planner. So that's the sort of most rigid option. Um, people were asked to make a choice. Um, what is the best choice for you? on this one to seven scale. Uh, in the control condition, this sentence about following your head was not there. Um, in the follow your head instructions conditions, people were asked to please make the choice by following their head. And then in the other condition, this looked very similar, but you were asked to indicate what is the best choice for another person trying to eat healthy. Uh, what we found is that um, here, in the control condition, uh, we replicated these previous effects where people were more, were choosing more flexibility in this case for themselves than for somebody else. So they're sort of more at the midpoint between flexible and rigid for themselves. Uh, however, when we explicitly tell them to make this choice by following their heads, um, people are now choosing more similarly for themselves than for others. Uh, and they're in general choosing pretty rigid plans. Um, so this significantly attenuates the effect as indicated by the significant interaction. So we thought that uh, in combination, these two studies provide strong evidence that something about following your head versus following your heart is important here. And in particular, that people are following their hearts more for themselves than for somebody else, which is leading them um, to choose these appealing flexible plans more often. Uh, so in the next studies, we were interested in understanding how do we get people to choose rigidity for themselves. Um, given a lot of the prior work suggests that rigidity is often a good idea in terms of achieving your goals, uh, we thought that it would be important to understand if we can use these insights to nudge people towards a more rigid plan. And uh, one thing we thought about was, well, what's happening when you're following your heart um, versus following your head? And we think that when people are following their head, they're thinking more about and placing more weight on what's going to help them stay on track to their final goal. Um, and indeed, in a pilot study, when we asked them, like, are you more likely to think about staying on track when you're following your head or when you're following your heart? Um, people say, 85% of people say, I'm more likely to think about that when I'm following my head. Um, and so we expect that that type of consideration is looming larger when people are choosing for others than for themselves. Uh, but if we could get people to be similarly thinking about and waiting, staying on track uh, when they're choosing for themselves and when they're choosing for others, then we should make their choices more similar and also be able to nudge people in the self-condition to a more rigid plan. Uh, so that's the logic here. Um, we're hoping that if we make salient the idea of staying on track, um, it will increase the importance placed on it based on some prior work that things that you attend to tend to get more importance um, and therefore cause people to choose more rigid options. So in this study, uh, we ended up 
asking people to think about improving their fitness. Um, and we told them there are different things you can prioritize when coming up with a workout schedule. Now, the wording here is a little different from prior studies because this is wording we're gonna use in a field study in 4B. Um, and this is the wording that was more consistent with the marketing materials for the company. Um, so we told them that they could prioritize consistency and structure, or they could prioritize flexibility to change things as they go. Um, so for example, you could have a consistent and structured schedule to work out Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 7 a.m., or have a more flexible schedule where you work out three times a week, but you decide exactly when on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's the idea here. Uh, we, in the control condition, so there are, I remember our, it's a two by two control, uh, self versus other and control versus stay on track. In the control condition, people were presented this scenario um, and then they made choices for what was the best choice for themselves and what was the best choice for someone else. In the stay on track condition, we uh, did the same thing, but in the middle, we asked people to indicate what was most effective for improving their fitness and what was best for staying on track to achieving a goal. The idea here is that merely posing the question and getting them to answer it is going to make that salient. Uh, and so we expected in this condition, um, the self and other choices to look more similar and uh, to be more rigid. In terms of what people actually answered, uh, so people in general indicated that a rigid, that consistent and structured schedule is more effective for improving <clears throat> your fitness and is best for staying on track to achieving a goal to improve your fitness. Um, we include everybody here, so we don't just include people who answered the way we expected. It's more of an intent to treat analysis, but I wanted to show you that people answered in a way we might expect. Uh, and in terms of what they actually choose, in the control condition, we replicate, um, we replicate the prior studies that people chose a flexible uh, workout plan more for themselves than for somebody else. Um, but in the stay on track condition, this is uh, attenuated and people are choosing more similarly and um, tend to choose flexibility left less often, both for themselves and for somebody else. Uh, so this leads me to the uh, field study that we did, trying to figure out whether we could actually sort of shift people's choices in the field. Um, so this is a, done in partner with a company or as with a company partner who's Flexit. Um, Flexit is a company that pairs you with a personal trainer virtually. So um, you would have a personal trainer, but you'd work with them remotely through like an app or through your computer. Uh, and they were interested in prioritizing getting people on recurring schedules um, because those people with this more consistent recurring schedules um, tended to be more successful and tended to stay on their programs longer. So there was an opportunity to sort of figure out how can we nudge people in that direction. And what we did was we looked at uh, people's behavior when they're taking a quiz during sort of an onboarding process. So when you get to the Flexit website, you're asked to take a quiz. In this case, it's take our goals quiz. Um, and this information is used to figure out what type of product options to highlight to you and also given to the trainers to help the trainers ultimately make you successful um, in terms of achieving your goals. We were most interested in this question about scheduling workouts. Um, so in the control condition, the question reads, when I schedule workout sessions, I want to uh, prioritize consistency and structure or prioritize flexibility to change things as I go. And we wanted to figure out whether we could nudge people towards that consistency and structure option. So we thought that if we highlight the idea that consistency and structure can help you stay on track. Um, consistent with the study I just showed you, people should be more drawn to that option um, and more likely to choose it. And so in the stay on track condition, 
um, everything was the same, except that we added these few words. So it says prioritize consistency and structure to make sure that I stay on track. Um, so that's the manipulation. Uh, we ran it for a month um, and here are the results. Uh, we had about 1400 people complete the quiz. Um, in the control condition, uh, people chose consistency and structure about 64 and a half percent of the time. When we made more salient the idea that that can help you stay on track, um, consistency and structure was chosen more often 76.3% of the time. So uh, we think this is a useful intervention. Um, the idea that uh, the stay on track language can help you uh, sort of shift people to choosing the option that they know is, is the right choice, but they might not necessarily want to do emotionally. Sydney, will you be able to get results about how they did afterward? Like if you force people to choose consistency and structure for whom that's not natural or normal, like do they still kind of fail out or does it actually help bring them on? Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, we, I'm trying to think about it. The, the, we, I'm sure that we could follow up and ask the reality in terms of power is that once you get from people taking the quiz to people signing up and ultimately looking at their behavior, um, there's some drop off that makes it harder to test things with any degree of power in the behavior range. Um, so I think we could take a look, but we'd be more underpowered there if that makes sense. Um, yeah, uh, but you're right because Flexit has this, um, they, they do have this correlation, but there is some selection question there, of course. Uh, so yeah. just a question from the audience has come through is whether the field study intervention means that it actually changed people's goals in the platform or is it just a response to a goal question? Like, I guess, what, what are the actual consequences of, of answering the question this way? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, to be clear, um, it, uh, this was this information was communicated to the trainer and also um, some of the way you answered things um, could change what they like said hey here's a plan that might be good for you um, but it is not them committing to a specific it's not their ultimate plan choice that they're committing to and paying for um, so I, ho I hope that makes sense so while it is you know field data and it's not completely irrelevant to what they eventually do and that it's communicated to trainers and things like that. Um, it is not the, the plan choice they pay for. Um, the reason we didn't end up going to the plan choice they pay for um, is sort of related to Kate's question of uh, the power considerations. We looked at the power and we said, ah, we could do that, but it would take over a year. And that seems like an awfully long time. Um, and that is with our most sanguine effect size uh, estimates. Um, so that was why we ended up going with this quiz was we thought it was good to at least get some power, even if it wasn't perfect. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so, uh, in terms of practical implications, we think that this, um, study in particular helps, um, us figure out how to nudge people in one direction or another. Um, it seems that describing these consistent, detailed, rigid plans as helping you stay on track will increase the uptake of these plans. Um, it increases their appeal, making more salient this belief that, you know, this is going to be the effective option. Additionally, uh, we think in some, this research suggests that if you add more opportunities to interact with other people on your app, then the rigidity, rigid plans or rigidity is going to be more appealing. And there are lots of ways you could imagine doing that. You could sort of add forums or other ways to connect with people or even allow people to sort of hire trainers and things like that. And we think all of those types of um, features will end up increasing the appeal of rigidity overall. Uh, 
And so um, before I take remaining questions, just to sort of summarize, if you remember two sentences from this talk, I would like them to be these sentences. Uh, people think flexibility is the best choice for me, but not for you. Um, and one reason is that people follow their hearts more when choosing for themselves and flexibility sounds more intuitively appealing, albeit less effective. Okay, and so I'm happy to take lingering questions, uh, questions from the audience at this point. Um, th thanks, Sydney, that was really interesting. Uh, can I just ask a, a high level question, which is, do you think there are any, do you think there are any domains in which the opposite happens in terms of basically people advise other people to, to follow their hearts more? like maybe in romantic context or like, I don't know. I mean, I was trying to think about it. I can't really easily think of one, but is there any case where you think it might flip? Yeah. Um, maybe when the ultimate, so in here, here the goal is to do this kind of self-improvement goal that ha involves some self-control. Maybe when, this is almost related to cheesecake in some ways, but like, Maybe when the goal is a little different, people instruct people differently. I think that Nora and I have talked about the intuition that you do ask, tell people to follow their hearts more often when you're like deciding whether to like ask someone out on a date than you would maybe do for yourselves. Um, but I'm not sure exactly what the key, the key difference is there. I suspect it might be the goal type, but I'm not positive. Um, hey, I'm wondering, how people think about their goals in the future. So it's not me and my present self, but my future self. I've been thinking about this in study 1A, where you were taught, where you were having people in their, in their study period or their finals period. And I was imagining, what if you were asking them for next year's class? And I sort of, my intuition was that a lot of people would sign up for the more rigid goal for themselves when thinking about themselves off in the future, rather than thinking about themselves right now. Um, I was wondering if you ran any studies and if, if that intuition, if that's right, and whether then pre-commitment ends up being another viable strategy uh, for getting people into something more rigid. Yeah, um, so I think that there's lots of reasons based on prior literature to think that that would be the case, that if you have people choosing for themselves and others in the future, basically self looks more like other and there's an attenuation, right? Because you know, we don't feel as closely connected to our future selves. And also maybe like those things, those emotional factors maybe don't loom as large when we're thinking about making a decision a year from now. Um, we don't have any empirical tests, I think that properly test that specifically. Um, but based on if, if this prior work, you know, based on this prior work about how we think about ourselves in the future, I might expect that it would be annuated there, as you say. So that might be another uh, intervention. And I think that's an intervention that's been tested in some past literature too. Sydney, I was wondering, um, you might have mentioned this, and apologies if you did, is, is there any evidence that it, it is actually more aversive for people to follow a rigid as opposed to a more flexible plan? And I'm sort of wondering, you could imagine it, it It might not be because you kind of have to muster up more self-control in a way when you're doing something flexibly as opposed to just sticking to the schedule. And I'm wondering if kind of reminding people of that or making them aware of that might be another pathway to intervention here. Yeah. Um, so I think that you're, so you're right. And I think that's almost like mirrored in the, the split. It's not everybody thinks it's more unpleasant to do the rigid plan um, because you could also see like, oh, if I form a habit, which maybe is more likely under a rigid plan then maybe it becomes automatic and easy. Um, the only thing I can think of to that effect off the top of my head is um, uh, the deadlines Ariely paper from 2002. I think people did say it was like a less um, pleasant experience when they were pre-committing with more strict deadlines. Um, so there is some evidence that in some cases, people actually do have a less pleasant experience under the rigid option. Um, but it, I also share the intuition that that might, that might depend. Like if you truly develop a habit, maybe ultimately it's actually more pleasant. So, so you've been 
talking about everything within um, this, you know, rigid versus flexible uh, planning. But I guess I'm wondering, especially with this fall your head, fall your heart mechanism, is this one instantiation of a broader phenomenon that I'm just more willing to impose sort of harsh constraints uh, on other people than I am on myself. So like if I'm like, oh, I want to go to the gym every day uh, this week. And if I don't, um, I'm going to you know, give some money to like a detested politician. Like how much will that be? You're like, I don't know, maybe $5 because I'm kind of worried I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to fail. But if I'm like, all right, I'm going to set this up for, for late. Uh, and be like, yeah, and he's going to give a hundred bucks, you know, to Ron DeSantis uh, when he doesn't make it to the gym every day. Um, like that's easy for me to do to someone else, which is sort of maybe like what your, all of your heart measures is tapping into. It's like, oh, I don't want to do that for myself. But it's easy to impose its constraints on others. Do you think there's something special about the rigidity flexibility or is it a specific instantiation of something like that? Yeah. Um, so I think that I share your, intu your intuition that you might be harsher, as you say, on other people. Um, one reason, or one thing I sort of glossed over is that um, we conceptualize rigidity for, versus flexibility as something that can be operationalized in a variety of ways. Often we, in our studies, talk about like adding more detail, but you could imagine rigidity versus flexibility also being operationalized as like how big are the costs for deviating from the plan? Um, like where flexibility is like, you can more costlessly deviate. Um, so for example, you might add rigidity by um, meeting up with a friend at the gym. And so then there's more cost if you decide to bail. Um, so I would actually think of that as another different way um, to add some rigidity um, by, by increasing the cost for, for uh, deviating from the plan. Um, and I would think that you would find some similar results. Um, yeah. I say it's sort of, sort of related. Um, what are the cases where we are like, hey, other person, go ahead and like do what you want. Like, what is, what is it okay to let somebody else be flexible? Like how does, when, when we find that kind of uh, effect? Uh, yeah, so thanks, Nora. Um, we do find that this isn't always, you, unsurprisingly, you do not always just give people this unpleasant, rigid thing. Um, so for example, we do have a study where we look at gift giving, um, and gift giving is different from making a recommendation or choosing the best choice. In that case, often we have different goals. We want to choose something that will make people happy, choose something that comes from the heart that people want. Um, and so in that case, for example, uh, we find that self and other choices look more similar and we choose um, sort of more flexibility when we're giving somebody the gift of say a planner, we choose a more flexible planner for them as opposed to if we're making a recommendation or indicating what the best planner would be for them. Um, so this does depend on the goals you have and the, the type of choice you're making for somebody else. That's all great. Thanks so much, Sydney. Really interesting, really interesting talk and project. And thanks to all of our panelists who asked a continuous series of engaging questions. Uh, this has been really great for me. And thanks to all of our audience for being here and for submitting so good, so many good questions as well. Uh, we will all be back again next week. Uh, enjoy your weekend. Thanks a lot.